I'm Herbert Kellman, and I'm a professor emeritus at Harvard. Uh, my title is Professor of Social Ethics. Uh, and uh, I want to say something about my work in conflict resolution. Really, everything that I've done in my career and in many ways that I've done in my life uh, was preparation for, leading up to the work on conflict resolution that I've been actively engaged in for several decades now. Um, I went into social psychology. I chose social psychology as my field because I became convinced that it was the, it was the discipline that had probably the most to say about issues of peace and justice and social change that I was uh, concerned with. And I, I started out in many ways as a social activist before I became a social scientist. And of course, in many ways, I've continued to be a social activist. In graduate school, my uh, work focused, and, and in my early research, and in many ways continuing, my work fo focused on social influence and attitude change. I also got training and experience in group processes, including psychotherapy, group, group therapy, which I was interested in, not as a clinician, but as a student of uh, uh, therapy as an important area, as an area in which important changes in attitudes and in personality uh, take place. And my, my interest in, in these issues, particularly in issues of war and peace, um, which brought me into the field, I began to express them very quickly. Uh, I was, uh, uh, even, before, uh, even before I finished graduate school, I was involved in uh, the beginnings of what I think was the first uh, organized peace research group in the United States, uh, and also in the founding of the first journal in this field, the Journal of Conflict Resolution. So I go back. I uh, wasn't really trained in international relations, and so I made my way slowly into the field. Some of my early research uh, dealt with uh, the impact of uh, experience abroad on students and visiting scholars. And I, I did some, some, some research on, uh, in, in that area. I also did research on nationalism and national identity. Uh, but a, a major, so in many ways, all of this led up to the work that I have been doing uh, ever since. But in the 1960, an important event took place in my life. I met a man named John Burton, who was a former uh, uh, Australian diplomat, high-level diplomat, who had uh, gone into academia and who had developed an approach of, uh, to unofficial diplomacy, which at the time he called controlled communication, which I always thought was not a very fortunate uh, name. Uh, he invited me to come to London, where he was teaching at the time, to participate in an exercise, what we would now call the workshop, on the conflict in Cyprus. And that experience, of course, talking to, to Burton and participating in that event, uh, immediately, you know, I immediately felt this is what I'd been looking for. Uh, it was really putting into action some of the ideas about uh, uh, international relations and the psychological aspects of, uh, uh, of, of international relations, of war and peace, that I've been working on and been concerned about for so many years. And very early on, began to think about applying this approach to the Arab-Israeli conflict. And that really started with the, you know, the worst, first workshop uh, on the Arab-Israeli conflict uh, that I uh, did with colleagues uh, was in 1971. And that has then just, uh, just kept, kept going. Uh, basically, what, you know, my, what my work involves is bringing together as much as possible um, uh, representatives of the conflicting communities, but people who are not officials. In other words, I'm looking for people who are politically influential, politically very involved, uh, but who are not in official positions. They can be parliamentarians, but I mean not people who are in a foreign policy hierarchy. And I bring them together for direct communication with each other under the guidance 
of a, a third party consisting of uh, social scientists with uh, knowledge about uh, about conflict, about war and peace, and uh, also uh, as much, to, at least to a considerable degree, some knowledge about the particular conflict that they're working on. And this is what I've been doing. I mean, as I said, my first workshop was in 1971. I've done numerous, numerous others. I don't even remember the exact number. Uh, many of them have been, uh, most of them have been on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but I've also done some work in other conflicts. And uh, um, the, in, in the early years, uh, they have been mostly one-time workshops. In other words, I would have a particular group, small group of, let's say, Israelis and Palestinians come together for a uh, single event and uh, in later years, uh, I've been doing, uh, you know, first what we call the continuing workshop, and then uh, later uh, a working group. So I've had an Israeli-Palestinian working group. Uh, I've had two such working groups, which met over a series, over a number of, uh, over a number of years. The uh, basic, the essence of the approach is creating an environment, a setting, in which people from the two sides uh, talk to each other and listen to each other, and try to work together in shaping new ideas for resolving the conflict. Um, say a typical workshop, I mean, let's say a, a one-time workshop, you know, a workshop that just brings people together for this one particular occasion, will begin, well, I'll usually begin with, with trying to uh, um, break the ice, as it were, by having people talk about the situation in their own communities, because that makes it possible for them to talk about something that they know about and to treat each other as sources of information rather than as uh, enemies. And then we go on with uh, what I've called the needs analysis, where people on both sides, on each side, talk about the basic needs, the concerns, the fears that uh, need to be addressed if the conflict is to be resolved. Once we've gone a certain distance in that and established that they understood each other, that they're able, we do that by trying to get them to, to review what are the needs of the other as you heard them, and then the other has a chance to correct them. Once they've gone through that process, we then uh, um, go into a phase of joint thinking, which is, trying to think together about ways in which the, pro pro the conflict can be resolved or a particular issue in the conflict can be resolved that would be responsive to both sides' needs rather than just to my needs or your needs. Uh, and, you know, so each side has a responsibility to think about, uh, to bring up ideas that, uh, to generate ideas that would be responsive to both sets of needs as they have heard them. And then we move into a question of uh, what are some of the obstacles to that, and then what are some of the ways in which we could overcome these obstacles. So that's the basic kind of approach. Everything is done under conditions of com complete confidentiality, and uh, the, the third party uh, serves in many ways as a repository of trust. They can't trust each other. They, don't, they can't start out trusting each other. But essentially, the third party uh, performs performs that role. So that's the kind of work that we've been doing um, for many years. Uh, I think we have made small contribution uh, to uh, resolving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, although there's still a very, very long way to go. Um, but uh, this, in many ways, has been uh, has been the essence of the work, and it has utilized everything that I have done and learned and uh, thought about and theorized about uh, over uh, my entire career.